Yeah, um, great to see so many people interested in Leah Manning and her work. Um, and I'm one of that number. I'm going to talk about that, you see there. Um, and we're in Young Street today, but in Leah Manning's time, or in up to 1913 anyway, this was known as Albert Street. Uh, there were several Albert Streets in Cambridge, so they, they changed it. Now, why am I standing up in front of you? <clears throat> yeah, I wonder myself. But um, <laughs> I, as Peter said, I support Cambridge United, and I do wonder about that as well a lot. Uh, formed as Abbey United in 1912, or a little earlier maybe, I'm fascinated by the football club story. Um, but the, the, football, the story of the football club is, of course, about who won, what, when, where, how, but it's more than that for me. Uh, the story of a club is the story of its people, its community, and in the early days, Abbey United was very much a Barnwell club. So I'm intrigued by Barnwell people of the early 20th century, and today I'm talking about this district, the St. Matthew's district of Barnwell. I'm showing some photographs, uh, Barnwell people and places. Some have come from the Cambridgeshire collection who are represented today. Thank you very much for those photographs. Um, what would we find if we could transport ourselves back to 1908, I think it was, when Leah Manning started work here full time? Um, I think the first thing that would strike us uh, if we ventured into these streets would be the terrible, terrible smell. Now, there were the gas works over where Tesco is now. <coughs> they weren't very fragrant. The cement works up Colden's Lane, not very far away. The breweries in the area, the sugar boilers, the slaughterhouses, and there were at least five of those in this area, immediate area to, that I know of, um, they would have all contributed to that awful smell. But the worst culprit, these guys, the Castle Soap Company. Uh, they had their works just down the end of the street here, towards where the uh, Crown Court is now. To get an idea of the appalling pond, from the soap factory, you have to imagine the stench from the slaughterers' carts coming to the factory here through the streets, carrying rancid fat and other animal remains, and then the reek as these bits and pieces were boiled, rendered down to produce, ironically, sweet smelling toiletries. So there was a high chimney to try and take this vile effluvium away, but uh, it wasn't nearly high enough. Um, so apart from walking round with clothes pegs on their noses, how did the people of St Matthews live? Conditions in Barnwell had certainly improved a little since 1853, and that was the year the Cambridge Chronicle uh, ranted about Barnwell. All this poverty and barren dreariness, it said. Um, the writer was, of course, convinced, as were many people at the time, that the poverty was of the people's own making. Every Barnwell well man was a drunken villain. Every woman a slatternly prostitute. We've come some way from those libels, but Barnwell was still an area of great deprivation in Leah's time. Um, 1906, Eglantine Jeb found 12 cases of six or more people sleeping in one room. She found 15 houses sharing one tap. 1912, one lodging house had a sitting room that was used as a bedroom at night, and 12 people slept in that room. Um, the parish vicar was Frank Gwynn at the time. He talked about a road almost knee deep in mud in winter and the children uh, had to walk to school ankle deep. And I came across a story of a woman who was up in court for stealing a pair of boots from a shop. Why was she stealing? Because her daughter had no shoes 
and uh, she certainly wasn't the only shoeless child in Barnwell. Stats from the borough medical officers' reports can throw some light on the lives of the kids. Uh, 1907, 266 children out of 1,500 interviewed had weekday jobs outside school hours. Errand boy, paper boy, milk boy, that sort of thing. And among them, this is scarcely credible, among them were five eight-year-olds and 18 nine-year-olds. After the war, by 1919, things were not much better. 333 boys and 130 girls were working outside school hours. And there was one poor, poor mite, as Leah Manning might have described him, of six years old and one of seven. Uh, by the way, that same year, there were 10 cases of malnutrition reported among the school children. Among the cases dealt with by the local charity organisation society are many instances of Barnwell people looking for help while they or their spouse were out of work or laid off or ill or injured. James Hunt, Bradmore Street, foundry worker at the pit press, he was, he needed help to get an elastic stocking for his son. And poor old Thomas Swan, this is a guy I feel really sorry for. He was a carter, but uh, he had a cart, but he didn't have anything to pull it. So he needed £10 uh, in order to buy a horse. I don't think you'd have got much of a horse for £10 even then, but anyway. Elizabeth Hinson was a charwoman in Smart's Row. She needed help to find work while her husband was in hospital uh, with painter's colic. We know that as lead poisoning. Um, Elizabeth didn't have a great war. She was up in court at one stage for causing an obstruction outside the school in Melbourne Place. Uh, the school was occupied by troops at the time. She, why was she waiting? She was waiting to see a soldier who owed her money um, for doing his washing, and she needed that money. And yeah, while I'm on the subject of the war, uh, I have with me a few copies of Barnwell at War, a little booklet uh, about the everyday lives of working class people in East Cambridge during uh, the World War I. To you, a fiver. <laughs> Employment in Barnwell in Leah's time. We often get the impression that Cambridge people were, were just there to uh, serve the colleges. Uh, that's not the case, according to some research I've done, not the case in this area. I found very few college servants in St. Matthews in the 1911 census. New Street alone, New Street just over the back here, I found 185 people with occupations. 78 of them, so nearly half, were labourers. Uh, whether uh, working on the roads, in the building trade, the gas works, uh, brickyards up the road, uh, the cement works in Colden Lane, wherever. They were labourers. Um, and 15 were factory hands, 12 were doing laundry work, not all directly for the colleges. There was the model laundry uh, at the time in Colden Road. 11 were child women. 10 shop assistants, 9 animal boys, 6 hawkers, 5 domestic servants, and just 4 were college servants. Now I'm going to finish by looking at um, some memories left for us by a lady called Margarita Stern. Born in Barnwell, 1910, and she went to this very school. Uh, you can find her memories in the Cambridgeshire collection. First, Margarita lived in Rebar Place, which is off Sleaford Street. Um, her next door neighbours were the Hobbses. But the oldest son, Jack, he wasn't there much at the time. He was away with Surrey and England being, becoming one of the world's greatest cricketers. <laughs> Margarita's family moved to Vicarage Terrace and she says, we were poor, everyone was. Now she was four when war broke out. And one day during the war, she says, Mum and I went to Sol Solomon Green's greengrocer's shop on Mill Road 
and joined a long line of people queuing to get potatoes. This is a very well known photograph and Margarita and her mum are in there somewhere. I wish I could identify them. What else did the Stearns eat besides uh, spuds? Um, sometimes mum bought what she called red-eye soldiers. These were incredibly salty, dried herrings that kids had to drink water for hours afterwards. Or there might be pig's trotters or dried peas, soaked all day, cooked all evening till they were nice and mushy. Uh, or there was a soup kitchen in Fitzroy Street where you could get a jug of soup for tuppence and a piece of bread for a halfpenny. Now, this is Miss Thompson's class. Uh, New Street School in 1920, but uh, Mrs. Manning was the teacher that Margarita remembered. She loved Leah and she was proud to have been her pupil. One day, the New Street children had a holiday and a picnic, and he here comes my precious little football connection. Um, the kids, so the kids marched up Newmarket Road with a donkey at the head of the procession and Margarita's sister Connie dangling the proverbial carrot. <laughs> and they had their picnic in cut through lane, Margarita says. Uh, everyone called it cut throat lane and I'm very pleased to say they still do. <laughs> Abbey United first played down cut throat lane in the 1920s and it's possible, I like to think, that the kids had their picnic in the field that Abby played on and that later became known as the celery trenches. There we are. I hope you've learned a little bit. I certainly have learned a little bit about St Matthews and Barnwell. Um, that's my lot. Thank you very much.